offer to her. Uh, Juliana Chamedes, a member of the faculty here at UW-Madison in the history department, who will be introducing Adam. Thank you, Patrick, and hello to you all. Good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. It's really an honor and a delight to be here to introduce Adam Tews. Adam Tews is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History at Columbia University. And he started out as an expert in modern German history. Many of you may know some of those fields changing books that include statistics in the German state, 1900 to 1945, the making of modern economic knowledge and his wages of destruction, the making and breaking of the Nazi economy. In his subsequent magisterial book, The Deluge, The Great War and the Remaking of the Global Order, Adam further elaborates on some of the arguments and wages of destruction, and he shows how America's economic power shaped World War I and the settlement that followed. In 2019, Adam published Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World, and this book, which like his previous books was award-winning, anatomizes the global financial system and it exposes the really terrifying depth of a crisis that was a crisis unlike any other crisis in history. Adam is at work on two forthcoming books as well. Um, I'm very excited about them both. The first is entitled Shutdown, and it's about the global response to the corona crisis and how it has changed our understanding of the limits and possibilities of modern economies. I have a hunch that we're going to get a preview of this book today. The second book that Adam is working on is entitled Carbon, and that book looks at the intimate inner workings of the global fossil fuel economy since 1945, and if I understand correctly, it will look at why it is so hard for us to wrest ourselves free from this economy. His talk today for the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice is entitled 2020, A World in Crisis. And there's a question mark at the end of that title, but I'm guessing for many of us, that question mark was automatically converted in our heads as an exclamation point. Uh, Adam, it's a really a pleasure to introduce you. You have the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Good. Well, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's lovely to see you, Gianna. Uh, I fondly remember my last visit to uh, Wisconsin. Um, very sorry not to be able to be there in person uh, this fall. Um, I'm going to be really, this is quite a descriptive exercise that I'm engaged in this, uh, this afternoon. I think like most of us, I'm still struggling really to find what seems to be the appropriate frame to make sense of what we've all been living through. I, th I think we settled on the title, which really is no more than a placeholder because when we were trying to book this gig, as it were, it was incredibly difficult to know what situation we would be in. So we picked something vague. And I'll at least try to fill out that slot with some ideas about how we might locate the events that we have been living through and set up, therefore, the possibility of an analysis, though we might have to do quite a lot of that in the Q&A that follows, or as Juliana uh, kindly indicated, it, it may have to wait until the, the book, which should be out. Well, I've just actually met with the publishers. We will, it'll be out by September next year. So, if we think about, if you think, if you can remember back to the beginning of this year, January, February, I think it was pretty clear already then that this wasn't necessarily going to be smooth sailing. Um, even before Corona struck, uh, we were struggling to find our historical bearings um, from the climate crisis to populism, to the end of multilateralism, talk of trade wars or a new Cold War. We had a variety of different labels uh, for describing the historical conflicts that faced us, um, none of which pointed to a calm scene. Um, I've got Xi's picture up on the left-hand side there because the foundation is not perhaps as widely appreciated as it might be in the West, but the, the basic justification for his regime, his one-man regime, is that China is living through a period of major changes never seen before. So the basic premise of his rule and his increasing the authoritarian rule is that China is facing huge challenges, hence the upbeat tone of his New Year speech, which he gave 
into the as it were into the winds of the oncoming epidemic over the over over the beginning of this new year in the eu in the uh, really ever since 2015, the, the buzzword of the day has been the notion of polycrisis, which Jean-Claude Juncker made famous in 2015. And, and in EU studies amongst social scientists, the new school is that of post-functionalism, which might as well also be called dysfunctionalism. And as for the United States, well, it seems to me that the vast majority of people on this call will share the sense that the country has been living through years, if not decades, of what are, in a sense, a distinctively national crisis. Um, it was that which um, triggered the Munich Security Conference in February 2020 this, to this positively post-apocalyptic rendering. This is, this is the security studies analogue to Davos, you have to understand. This was, their, this was their brochure for this year, the torch of liberty cross with a protester's flare against a sort of decaying ruin. Um, and this is, of course, rooted in a diagnosis of America's problems, which were manifest uh, even before we entered this year. If you think back to the 2016 election, we had, after all, uh, no reason to expect anything different from what we have witnessed in this year. Um, this was the last campaign spot run by the Trump campaign. Uh, some people have called it the most overtly anti-Semitic piece of political propaganda run in an American, a modern American political campaign denouncing George Soros, Janet Yellen, misspelt, um, and blank fine the head of Goldman Sachs at the time, who have in common, of course, money, but also, also being Jewish. Uh, Trump at the time made no secret of the fact that he didn't necessarily intend to respect the outcome of the election. And in fact, even when he won, he contested it, feeling that the system must have defrauded him of extra votes, which would have given him a popular majority. So this year was shaping up to be a year of crisis in any case. And then, of course, we were hit by Corona. This is the latest number of this is the latest graph of mortality from the corona epidemic it's a global graph i think very telling for that reason uh, and you can see uh, the extraordinary shape of this of this pandemic as it sweeps across the world originally a us european a north atlantic phenomenon as it bursts out of china in february uh, then increasingly in america a crisis of the americas and now in its third phase if you like uh, returning to Europe with a vengeance uh, and to the United States and, of course, uh, Wisconsin, amongst other places. By the spring, we saw the truly astonishing spectacle of the power elite of the world, the big voices in the world of finance and money, who normally convene in Washington, D.C. for the so-called spring meetings of the Bretton Woods institutions, that's the IMF and the World Bank meeting, in the form of a video conference and announcing that the world faced, in the words of Kristalina Georgieva, the Bulgarian managing director of the IMF, um, that the world faced a crisis like no other. Uh, Gita Gopinath, the chief economist of the IMF, backed this up with a string of analyses which demonstrated that the world economy really did face a shock of the type that we've never seen before. And since then, we've seen, as it were, a sort of expanding a uh, gyro of crises that has spread outwards and I think um, shaken the existing order to its foundations. Um, what it is that we face is a expert diagnosed mediatized threat um, which is analyzed and dra dramatized through epidemiological models, the most dramatic of which were those being published by Imperial College London, uh, which in the middle of March changed the conversation about how to handle the epidemic on both sides of the Atlantic. What was at stake above all is after all not just the lives of millions of people who might become victims, but the continued functioning of key parts of the modern infrastructure uh, of society. And this centers therefore the anxiety of the epidemic centers really on the functioning of hospitals. We all remember the scenes from Wuhan, from Bergamo, and then uh, from Queens in New York um, in the spring. This then triggers a massive collective reaction to the crisis in, as it were, the liberally coded battles that have happened since the outbreak of the crisis. This has become, as it were, a story of the imposition of lockdowns 
by oppressive governments. But in fact, what we see in the spring and beyond the evidence is completely unambiguous on this score, is a collective response by individuals, households, businesses, organizations, universities uh, around the world, all having individually to make choices about how they're going to handle a dramatically changed risk envelope. To counter the economic fallout we uh, collectively, national governments practically around the world, I'll show you some really rather dramatic numbers in a second, launched unprecedented fiscal and monetary responses to this crisis, which then triggered quite reasonably with regard to the scale of these actions, analogies to nothing less and nothing short of the war economies of the mid 20th century. The threat itself and the countermeasures adopted unleashed a comprehensive and contentious debate about the foundations of social and cultural order, a debate about who were and who were not essential workers, uh, unlikely venues like the Financial Times canvassing the idea of a new social contract, vicious debates about the question of reopening, which as we know in the United States spilled over into something close to armed insurrection fundamental debates about individual liberties over the question of whether or not we would wear face masks. And feeding off these tensions then and tying into other pre-existing stresses around the world, this spawns an eddying dynamic of national and international conflict, vaccine wars intersecting with trade wars, with tech wars, and by the summer with the so-called new Cold War with China. The result, I think, is fair to say, is a sort of un enduring unsettlement of the status quo, uh, with which then again, to which then again, uh, groups respond either by strategies of increasingly sophisticated reflexivity about how we mandle, manage our responses to this crisis, flat out denial, or some sort of a demand that we should return to basics and recognize that coronavirus is essentially no different from flu, and we should tough, we should simply tough it out. This, before I focus in for a minute on the economic, economics, I think as it were a broad brush description of the scale of the crisis that we face. As to the economy, the shock is really, as the IMF said, like nothing we have ever seen before. So this is a very fancy piece of uh, numerical uh, uh, work, footwork here by Goldman Sachs's investment research group. And what they've done is they've taken global GDP numbers and they've adjusted them. They've used as indicators uh, a set of indicators of lockdown intensity that Oxford University has compiled. And then you map that onto the global economy and you can make rough guesses as to how rapidly different bits of the global economy were contracting, how rapidly they have rebounded. And then you can aggregate all of that into this sort of pie chart of the slices, the shares attributed to the different parts of the world. And you can see here the way in which initially the shock is driven by the Chinese lockdowns, far too easily forgotten that happened in February, followed by the collective shutdown really of the, the rest of the world economy, producing a 20% dip in global activity in the spring of this year, followed by the very partial rebound, which has given rise to talk about a swoosh recovery, uh, a, a, a the, the, the square root sign recovery, or simply the 90%, or as you can see here, the, like the 95% economy that the economist has been touting as an idea. So 20% shock to global economic output of this type. How, how radical is that? How, how unlike previous experience is it? Well, one thing you have to do to estimate that is to map it against the previous trap of global GDP. There aren't good global GDP data going map back much before the 1950s. You can do estimates but for our purposes this graph will serve um, and what it shows you is the fact that broadly speaking even across shocks like 2008-9 which is the little indentation that you can see on the right hand side of this graph global GDP expands uh, more or less continuously over time and so a 20% shock to global output in a matter of months is totally unprecedented and it looks like this so 2020 will go down in economic history as the most severe, most sudden shock the world economy has ever experienced. And it is indeed comprehensive. So this is another way of mapping the, uh, the scale of the impact. This is simply counting the number of countries which are experiencing recession at any given moment. And what the World Bank is telling us is that by its estimation, over 95% of the world economies will have been in some sort of contractionary phase um, in the second quarter of 2020. That is worse, more comprehensive than the shock that was suffered by the world economy in the early 1930s.
in terms of the labor market to bring this down to real experience, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. The ILO, which represents organized labor at the UN level, um, estimates that 80% of the global workforce, that's 3 billion people, were under one form or another of lockdown by early April this year. This is a shock like one, no other that we have ever experienced, not entirely without reason, France, French President Macron spoke about an anthropological shock, cashed out in terms of the number of days lost and working years lost. We're talking about a contraction in global employment of about 365 million people. Uh, if that number sounds sort of just outlandish and crazy, we think that individually China and uh, India uh, suffered a loss of employment of about 80 to 100 million jobs between late March and early April. The best guess is as to Indian unemployment rates by the end of April, which are of course complicated because such a large part of the Indian workforce is informal. But the best guesses are that 25% of the Indian workforce was unemployed by late April. This is an epic shock, unlike and worse than anything the world economy has ever experienced and experiencing it simultaneously. So not in the normal staggered way that we are used to. It is also completely unusual in that it affects a much wider variety of sectors than we've ever seen before. So the standard cyclical pattern in a modern economy is that the cyclical shock is carried forward by heavy industrial sectors, by manufacturing, by investment goods. It is therefore also intensely gendered in its experience. In, in its experience. Business cycles are broadly experienced by male workers on the downside and on the upside. The, one of the really remarkable features of 2020 is that it is the first recession to have affected women in the advanced economies more than men. So by a bitter irony, 2019 was the first year in which women outnumbered men in the employed labor force of the United States. And promptly on Q2020 is the first recession in which American women suffer more unemployment than men. Um, savage damage to the, the, the service sector labor market. And as we know, the uh, preeminent, uh, as it were, the backbone of that labor force is Latina, and it is above all uh, Latina women, uh, the Latina that have suffered the worst shock to their labor market position in the United States. But this is a pattern that repeats itself across much of the world economy. But if you break this down by country, it's, it's, it's truly staggering, some of the numbers here. This is a slightly distorted graph because it's the second quarter of 2020. So on the right hand side, you have China, which at that point is already recovering. That is, however, one of the standout features of this year's experience. There will be one major economy that grows this year. It will be China. Everyone else will be contracting. And as you can see on the left hand side of this graph, some economies are contracting at a truly jaw dropping rate. So the Indian economy is thought to have contracted by about 25%, hence that epic unemployment number. But there's Britain as well amongst the advanced economies. The United States experience is sort of middling. It's bad, but it's not as bad as the vast majority of advanced economies, um, in part because of the, mo the scale of the stimulus, which I'll talk about in just a second. How bad is a 20% contraction for an advanced economy like the UK? It's like nothing we've ever seen before. In fact, the UK is one of the economies with the longest run of economic history records in the world. Um, they go back to the 17th century. And so we can say with a fair degree of certainty that the shock that the United Kingdom's economy suffered in this year is as bad as anything that the UK has experienced since the early 18th century, since the days of the wars of the Austrian succession and Louis XIV. I mean, this was so disorientating to me that I felt I had to figure out what had happened to the British economy in the early 18th century. And in part, it was the fact that Britain was fighting a major war against uh, absolutist France at the time. But the other reason that things were so bad is that it was the great frost of 1710. So at the time, of course, the British economy is overwhelmingly still agrarian and uh, a terrible winter and then through a, 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 a climatic shock of the time hurled Britain back into a major recession. But here is the run of 300 years of data and you can see the shock on the right hand side as it measures up against that. This isn't by any standard there for a truly devastating crisis and to meet it, to meet it, the forces that have been mobilized to countervail, if you like, against the scale of this shock have themselves been historically unique. 
This is a, a, a map of stimuli delivered around uh, the world. And the, the, the surprising thing about this is not that the colors are different. In other words, that rich countries are able to deliver larger stimulus than poor countries. That's not surprising in many ways. The fact of the matter is, however, that the vast majority of the world is colored one way or another. In other words, the vast majority of the world, with the exception of Yemen, pretty much, um, has delivered a major fiscal policy response. And this includes countries like Haiti, uh, which also managed a fiscal stimulus uh, this year. And in the case of some of the larger rich countries, but also in the case of uh, 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 Malaysia, for instance, uh, you see gigantic fiscal efforts, 10, 15% of GDP, South Africa at the bottom there in the order of 8% of GDP, uh, 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 an absolutely necessary shot into the, in the arm for an economy which we now think is suffering 30% unemployment with 60% plus amongst South African youth. So a huge fiscal effort on the one side and likewise, which of course then leads to a vast run up of debt. So the accumulated fiscal uh, obligations of the advanced economies are now heading back to World War II levels. Um, and this is true for emerging markets as well. But on the other hand, this is also complemented by a gigantic activism on the part of central banks, obviously something that uh, uh, I, a story I follow closely on, on the back of the book that Juliana kindly mentions at the beginning crashed on the financial crisis of 2008. We can talk much more about that in Q&A if you're interested. Um, but what central banks have been doing is in fact acting concertedly together with fiscal policy. One of the great, as it were, Chinese walls, firewalls that was built up in the era of neoliberalism was to separate fiscal and monetary policy from each other. This in the EU and the Eurozone is an art, a totem, it's an article of faith that the two things should be separated. What we've in fact seen this year is incredibly close cooperation between the two with a huge surge of debt being basically absorbed into the balance sheets of central banks. And the, again, the surprising thing uh, is not that the advanced economies have done this uh, uh, on a larger scale than others, but that large numbers of emerging markets have been doing it too. There is in fact, therefore, as you can see on the right hand side here, a relatively smooth continuum of options with South Africa down the left hand side. Uh, and uh, I can't actually see right now who's at the top, Japan at the other end, no surprise there. Um, um, but Poland, for instance, matching uh, the UK in terms of the scale of purchase. The significance of this is what you're doing by central bank purchases in the, uh, in the sovereign debt market is to stabilize uh, the funding flow uh, for central government. It's a synthesis between fiscal and monetary policy with rather dramatic implications. We could talk much more about uh, in the Q&A if you're particularly interested in this. But the upshot, if you like, and I was referring earlier on to the sort of quake running through um, underneath one of the major firewalls that were set up in the 1980s to establish the monetary and financial order of what we've come to know as neoliberalism, um, is, is amply and wonder, rather wonderfully captured by this brilliant cover of The Economist this year, which depicts, as it were, the central bank uh, treasury money machine uh, careening through a field of, of greenbacks. And it's against the backdrop of that also, um, that MMT, the heretical monetary theory espoused by large parts of the American left could have surged to the prominence that it has uh, with Stephanie Kelton's book, um, uh, ascending the, the ladder of the New York Times bestseller list earlier this year. This is a remarkable shift in the, in the, in the intellectual atmosphere and AOC and Jerome Powell uh, trading, um, trading uh, compliments essentially uh, in Congress committees. So we've seen a really dramatic shift in the structure of economic policy thinking. But it's not there that I really want to, as it were, head determinedly in the rest of today's talk. What I really want to do is to think about the broader way in which we situate this crisis. Because for all of the metrics, for all of the reasons I've just given you, this is clearly a singular shock. But what I'm interested in trying to do is to try and piece together how this fits into our broader understandings of late 20th and early 21st century modernity. And there, I think, the fundamental move to make, and this is this point at some, in some sense a commonplace, but what I'm struggling to do is to integrate this commonplace with our broader understanding of history since the, uh, since the really since the 1970s, as you see. Um, the, the point that I want to move towards is how we locate the pandemic, as it were, and our understanding of the pandemic as 
not just an economic and social shock, not just a, a political crisis, uh, but also reflecting the fundamental developments that have been captured in the area of epidemiology uh, by the idea of the infectious emerging or the emerging infectious diseases paradigm, which since the early 1970s has argued that the sort of crisis that we're suddenly facing now is not, as it were, exogenous. It's not just silly, it's simply a haphazard shock that has impacted on us. Um, uh, but as it were, is a direct result of an increasingly unbalanced relationship between society, the economy, and and uh, and our environment. Now, this at this point, I think in the in the discussion, it presumably doesn't come as news to anyone. I think the point to make, however, that this is not at this uh, this is not and has not from the very beginning really been a radical diagnosis simply. I mean, now we perhaps associate it with somebody like Mike Davis, um, whose uh, book, The Monster Enters, I just happen to have sitting here. Um, <laughs> but in fact, this is a, uh, an understanding of the relationship between economic and social development and environmental threat, which has completely mainstream status within um, epidemiology and uh, modern environmental science. Um, it has a long lineage. Uh, the, the paper that I enjoy most, uh, the, old, the paper which, as it were, marks a liminal point, dates to 1968, and it's called Old Plagues in the Jet Age, International Aspects of Present and Future Control of Communicable Disease. I say this marks a liminal, a sort of uh, transition point, because it refers to old plagues in the jet age. By 10 years later, by the time that we were facing the first swine, modern swine flu epidemic, by the time Ebola was identified, and then in 1982, the greatest killer of all, HIV AIDS, the question really was new plagues in the Czech age. So the transition, I think, that's absolutely fundamental that goes on in the 1970s and is periodically rediscovered and then uh, mobilized for, for the purposes of radical critique, but in fact sits nested within very mainstream public health debate from this moment onwards, is the question of whether or not economic development is not systematically increasing and generating the hazards uh, that we face. The backdrop against which this is, as it were, a shocking revelation is the theory of the epidemiological transition, the close counterpart to the demographic transition, which had huge salience and huge circulation in thinking about demography in the late 60s and early 1970s, the conquest of major epidemic disease, the most famous of which, of course, the conquests of polio. And this is put fundamentally in question by the possibility, A, that old plagues might travel better in the jet age, and B, by the even more awesome possibility that the modern age might actually systematically produce new plagues. And then the question is, essentially, and the question has been ever since the 1970s, do we have the means to cope? And the most you know, striking sort of photogenic moment of this sort of realization and this arms race beginning is the 1976 swine flu with President Ford, a remarkably butch looking President Ford, it has to be said, um, being injected um, in what turned out to be a disastrously misguided effort for the first time to chase a flu and to stop a flu pandemic in its tracks with, uh, with vaccination. And in making that move, the other place that I think that we need to situate, as it were, the crisis that we currently face and the broader context in which it needs to be situated is the emerging critique from the early 1970s, the emergingly and comprehensively radical critique of modernity delivered by the environmental movement. And I have to say, as somebody, as Giuliana was saying, who started the year working on the climate problem, it was actually rather surprising to discover the extremely prominent role played by virologists, microbiologists like René Dubot in shaping the increasingly comprehensive critique of industrial modernity delivered by the environmental movement from the early 1970s onwards. If you come to this story from the history of climate science, if you come to this story from the history perhaps of the Club of Rome report on the limits to growth and the question of, of raw material uh, shortages, 
Um, it was for me actually a surprise to discover the central role that virology and microbiology played right from the very beginning in the construction of what we know today as the modern environmental problematic. So René Dubois is alongside Barbara Ward, the co-author of the Only One Earth Manifesto, which set the stage for the famous 1972 Stockholm Conference, which is widely seen as the beginning really of the modern global environmental problematic. What is interesting, I think, is the extent to which by the 1980s, a critical sociologist in somewhere like West Germany, closely associated at the time with the Green Movement, like Ulrich Beck in his classic Risk Society, could already formulate what 15, 20 years later will be recast once more as the problem of the Anthropocene. So in advanced modernity, Beck tells us in 86, and it was to me really a considerable surprise to go back to this text, which I read when it first came out, but then reread this summer, um, to discover this extraordinarily uh, perceptive, uh, prescient description of the Anthropocene problem really in its fundamental understanding already in 1986. An advanced modernity society with all its subsystems of the economy, politics, culture, and the family can no longer be understood as autonomous of nature. Environmental problems are not problems of surroundings, but in their origins and through their consequences are thoroughly social problems problems of people, their history, their living conditions, their relation to the world as real and reality, their social, cultural and political situations. The industrially transformed domestic nature of the cultural world must frankly be understood as an exemplary non-environment, as an inner environment, in the face of which all our highly bred possibilities of distancing and excluding ourselves fail. At the end of the 20th century, nature is society and society is also nature. Anyone who continues to speak of nature as non-society is speaking in terms from a different century, which no longer capture our reality. This is four years before Bruno Latour would publish We Have Never Been Modern. And it's coming directly out of the mainstream of a critical, sociologically oriented or environmental discourse that is acquiring real momentum in somewhere like West Germany by the mid 1980s. And all of this is of course, simply building up to uh, the observation uh, that the basic way, surely, of understanding the shock that we are experiencing right now is indeed in terms of the relationship between emerging infectious diseases and the broader paradigm of the understanding, our broader paradigm for understanding the Anthropocene and the great acceleration in humanity's impact on the environmental envelope, which has been gathering ever greater momentum since 1945. It has a much deeper history. Um, but it acquires huge heft and increasing self-consciousness uh, really from the 1970s onwards. And for all of the relativizations that brilliant historians of the Anthropocene like Bono and Frezos have wanted to insert into this narrative, it does seem to me that there is a qualitatively new dimension to this from the 1970s onwards. The distinctive thing 50 years later about the 2020 shock for my mind then is that not, of course, that this is the first crisis of the Anthropocene. Think, for instance, of Hurricane Dorian that swept through the Caribbean last year, the most intense storm ever to have hit the region, or the gigantic typhoon that swept out of the Bay of Bengal this summer. The difference is that this is the one that we're experiencing with corona, totally comprehensive. So that, to my mind, is what makes 2020 really uh, dram dramatic. There were fantasies of a comprehensive crisis unleashed by anthropocen anthropocenic genealogies, but we are now actually living the reality of that. And one of the surprises is that it comes not at the pace of climate change, um, but as a single shockwave, if you like, running out across the world in a matter of days and weeks beginning at the beginning of this year. And the question, I guess, is the question as a historian, as a critical historian, that one asks that one asks oneself is if this diagnosis was already as strong and as clear, really, as essentially it was in the 1970s, were the moments at which we might have deviated, are the ways in which alternative courses could have been charted. And we know, of course, in the energy field that people like Amory B. Lovins were charting precisely those kind of options in the, 1970s, in the 1970s, with really prescient and comprehensive analyses of the political economy and power structures that were associated with the energy complex. And we know 
that there were radical ways in which one could respond to the diagnosis of the fundamental imbalance between humanity, society, and natural resources. Like it or not, agree or not with the diagnosis, as critical as one may be of the kind of Malthusianism that informed this, there's no question that the most radical decisions taken precisely in this direction were by the Chinese in the post-Mao era, at the beginning of the reform area between 1979 and 1982 in the adoption of the one-child policy, explicitly motivated by the kind of thinking about natural imbalance that in the West took the form of reports like the Club of Rome. The, dis the origins of China's one-child policy are complex, but there is a key group of technocrats associated with the Chinese state machine, in fact, specifically with the aerospace sector, who seem to have been very important in shaping this shift to radical interventionism. So paths which involved a massive redirection of society in light of this kind of critique were sketched in the West, were implemented in China, um, but in the West, broadly speaking, took the form of a kind of lukewarm, milkbread kind of global reaction, which has been the structure of global environmental sustainability and health discourse since the 1990s, starting with the Rio conference in 1992, which set in motion the COP process and was informed by the science of the IPCC. Um, uh, which set to work in the late 1980s. And it is also the 1990s that sees the efforts to reshape the WHO from a frankly post-colonial, uh, post-imperial structure uh, created in the aftermath of World War II to a World Health Organization that could actually meet the challenges of the emerging infectious diseases uh, uh, threat. But the reality of, of, the, of that discourse, of that governmental apparatus, um, as, as it were, continuous as the preoccupations with the problem of climate and global infectious disease threat as they may be, uh, and the discourse is unrelenting, and the cycle of conferences and the creation of agencies and the publication of reports from the late 1970s onwards is unrelenting. What is staggering about that, if you like, is the discrepancy between the increasing consciousness of these systemic risks, which we will then dram dramatize and describe from the early 2000s as the Anthropocene, and the actual capacity to act on them. Um, and in itself, as it were, the construction of the very idea of preparedness systematically lays down that frustration. Because once you describe this world as one of full of threat, as, as one full of threats, it becomes, as Ulrich Beck is so acutely diagnosed, incredibly difficult to draw the line and very, very difficult to prioritize. And a extraordinary proliferating debate about which risks to prioritize takes over with predictable. Um, distortions with huge focus, for instance, on issues to do with bioterrorism, but uh, extraordinarily slack pursuit of the sorts of vaccines that might be enabling us to uh, control actual threats. So the picture that I want to paint for you is of a sort of increasing cognitive dissonance between a extremely prescient diagnosis of the threats that we face, half century old, essentially, and a, a profoundly weak uh, actual response, which is after all essential for us being able to understand the shock and our inability to cope with it that have we, we have lived through, we have lived through this year. And if you want to understand um, that discrepancy, that cognitive dissonance, it seems to me, and again, I think um, this sense is widely shared that we need to go back to understand what else was happening in the 1970s at this moment, if you like, where we came, experts, expert uh, publics came to an awareness of uh, the scale of the challenges that we might be facing. And for contemporary historians today, the 1970s is really, as it were, are the happy hunting grounds for our understanding of uh, contemporary of contemporary history. We don't look so much back to 1945 as a foundational moment as to the moment of the 1970s. Why? Because this is the moment essentially where so many of the current problems that afflict our societies and our politics appear to run together. On the one hand, the first recognition, if you like, of this problem of the Anthropocene. Then the first, as it were, skeptical, the first um, uh, disillusioned diagnoses of the problems of capitalist democracy, 
emblematically the Trilateral Commission report on that problem in 1975. The disintegration of the golden age framework of economic growth, which had framed the so-called Trente Glorieuses in the period after World War II, with the collapse of Bretton Woods and the opening up of the era of great inflation between 1972 and 73. In global geopolitics and in the Cold War, the sudden and shocking reorientation of, of fronts initiated in the midst of the final stages of the Vietnam crisis by the Nixon administration's move towards China. So in the dimension of politics, in the dimension of political economy, in our understanding of the way in which both of those are embedded within an environmental envelope and at the level of geopolitics of interstate relations, the 1970s appear in retrospect, I think, as a truly protean, extremely formative period. One out of which, on the one hand, that thin line, persistent but nevertheless thin line of the problematization of the Anthropocene emerged on the one side, but on the other, of course, also the triumphant politics of, call it like you will, um, the unipolar moment, the triumphant politics of the reassertion of the American state, the triumphant politics of the market revolution or neoliberalism, which provided, if you like, an answer to the challenges of the 1970s and 1980s diagnosed in radically, in essentially radically prescient ways by contemporary social sciences, diagnosed and provided an, an answer that was fundamentally conservative and restorative. Fundamentally re and conservative and restorative in that the answer was to strip away the complexities of the political economy of the 1970s. The answer to the problem of democracy was to remove the problem of economic governance to an independent central bank. The answer to the problem of global power was to restore and entrench the dominate, dominating position of the United States, uh, which by the 1990s became uh, the Union Polar moment, which because conservative historians like Hal Brands uh, set out to explain um, uh, uh, in, in retrospect now. And it's that then which constructs, as it were, the possibility for uh, the immediate backdrop to our, uh, to our current crisis. Uh, for me, the, the benchmark of that world that we have lost, the, 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 the statement, the intervention that most crisply summarizes the answer that was given to the problems of the 1970s by way of shutting them down, by closing them off, by restoring existing power structures, um, is the legendary interview given to the Zurich Daily Tages and Anzeiger in 2007 by former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan. This was a, as a quote that Wolfgang Strake found, and uh, for all my differences with Wolfgang Strake, I'm eternally grateful for him for having discovered these lines, because they are, if you want, as it were, to understand the world that emerged out of that protean crisis of the 1970s by way of silencing and sidelining so many of the doubts that that era raised, and therefore also want to understand the perplexity of our last 10 years or so. This, this quote from Alan Greenspan seems to me to be as, as good a starting point as you can possibly hope for. So he was asked how he would vote in the upcoming election. So this is the one that will ultimately pit Obama against McCain and Palin. And his response is, it really doesn't matter. We're fortunate that thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the US have been largely replaced by global market forces. National security aside, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. The world is governed by market forces, just to reiterate the point. So the key elements here is that as it were, um, the, the government is removed to the market. Party political differences are therefore uh, neutralized. We have democracy, but the stakes are low. National security, interestingly, is still recognized as political, but by virtue of the fact that the political is separated from the economic, by implication, national security is also separated from the economic. So in other words, the world made by global market forces must, logically speaking, be geopolitically neutral. The premise being presumably that America's power is so overwhelming that no economically induced change could change it, or some sort of convergence theory by which if countries grow rich, they naturally converge so that they no longer pose any kind of geopolitical threat. And then fourthly, just a complete obliv obliviousness to the environmental envelope. Uh, there are no decisions to be made on that score because they're either not issues or they're all included in the calculus uh, of the economy so they can be ignored. This, the world, I think, of 
a certain sort of blind neoliberalism, uh, a, a market logic and market politics that will in fact then be blindsided by the shock, uh, uh, the shocks that are to come. Um, it's not entirely fair to say, of course, that this world um, was totally uh, blind to the challenges of the Anthropocene. Um, I think it's fairer to say that it believed and it continued to believe all the way down in subsenses to uh, the end of last year that most of these challenges could be contained by market solutions. They could be contained um, within logics of private insurance. Most notorious is the promotion of so-called pandemic insurance bonds by the World Bank, which were efforts to use the magic of securitization and the magics of financial engineering so as to provide low income countries with its disaster insurance on the back of essentially collateralizing, using as collateral aid pledges by Germany and the United Kingdom in particular. So this was, as it were, the reductio ad absurdum of uh, the market response to the potential risks of the Anthropocene. If the Anthropocene could be admitted at all, it would be by way of a problem that could be insured by way of some clever financial engineering. Meanwhile, what Ulrich Beck termed the collective irresponsibility or the organized irresponsibility of the moment was best captured by the truly jaw-dropping figures on the budget of the WHO at the, in the period. If you want, as it were, a single set of numbers which best exemplifies the Potemkin village nature of the global response to the well-diagnosed, well-analyzed, well-understood risks associated with mass globalization, the risks of modern plagues in the jet age, which had been so clearly identified already in the late 1960s and 1970s. <laughs> All you have to do really, I think, is look at the budget of the WHO, which if you haven't previously occupied yourself with issues of global public health, just simply beggars belief. Because at the top you have the United States, but then from down from there, it's a hodgepodge of private, you know, own brand foundations with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the number two position, followed by the UK government. And then you keep on going down and there are various UN agencies, but the one that really blew my mind completely was the appearance of Rotary International. This literally is, as it were, the iconic business, businessman, I think it has to be said, businessman's club of the mid-century world, which contributes more to the budget of the WHO last year than either France or China. So we're talking about, as it were, an organization with, with essentially no legitimate resource base, a resource base in total, which is no larger than that of a large urban hospital in the United States. It has a budget which allows it to spend about 30 to 40 cents per inhabitant of the globe at this point. A total, as it were, organizational expression of the cognitive disconnect between the well-established half century old diagnosis of the systematic, systematic interconnections between economic development and health risk, environmentally, environmentally induced health risk on the one hand, and the actual ability and willingness to mobilize resources to meet it on the other. So this broadly speaking is, as it were, the suggestion that, that it seems to me is the right way to try and understand the particular moment that we're in, in connection to some of the other crises and the other challenges that, as Juliana uh, uh, said, I've been sort of struggling to understand for the last 10 years or so. It seems to me that 2020 is the culmination of a process of unraveling in which the consequences of the organized irresponsibility of the last half century are basically exposed. And it starts most dramatically perhaps in 2008 with the, 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 the revelation of the fact that you can't assume that financial markets will effectively self-insure and stabilize. And in fact, that globalization will systematically create structures like the transatlantic banking system that are explosively unstable. Furthermore then, already visible in 2008, as I argued and crashed with regards to Russia, but now ever more prominent in our conversation, ever more prominent in the formulation of policy, the realization that the world governed by markets shifts the geopolitical frame because economic globalization, economic growth proceeds in an uneven and combined fashion such as to shift the geoeconomic landscape and the geopolitical terrain. 
with the Russian and Chinese challenge arising directly out of that. First Russia and now China as the dominant center of geopolitical preoccupation. Secondly, or thirdly, the ever more pressing and now as it were uh, shockingly imminent and obvious fact that economic growth governed by markets puts us in biopolitical jeopardy. It fundamentally challenges the stability of the environmental envelope on a scale of years, no longer of many decades with regard to the climate, and on a, scale, a time scale of days and weeks when it comes to the virus. Not the Anthropocene as an attritional struggle, as an arms race, as trench warfare, but the Anthropocene as blitzkrieg. The Anthropocene as something that will destroy your ability to function literally in a matter of days if the crisis is not contained, posing radically different problems of governance from the ones that we imagined uh, in the form of the climate crisis. And all of this hollowing out and progressively destabilizing the frame of capitalist democracy questions that were again posed 50 years ago already and revealing in a sh to a shocking extent the sheer absurdity of Greenspan's position back in 2007 neither in the 2016 nor of course in the 2020 election would it make even the remotest sense um to to you know every vote counts and 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 why because the problems of governance have been reposed in an absolutely fundamental way and the question of how to tackle these problems how to actually resolve them is anything other than self evident there is no one best way in economics that will tell you how best to handle the sort of broken situation that we find ourselves in as i was saying earlier on all sorts of heresies have entered the terrain which are therefore systematically politicizing the economics discipline. And that then in fact also becomes a matter of personal responsibility, starting with individual voters and all the way up to those engaged in the public arena in any way whatsoever. If for me there is, as it were, a shred of optimism or hope is not precisely the right word, but as it were a kind of healthy reorientation of the conversation, um, that emerges out of the corona crisis. It's in a sense to put all of this in perspective and it's really what's brought home uh, by the front cover of this week's Economist, Suddenly Hope. Because I think one of the truly telling aspects of that Greenspan quote, which for me so, so bitterly sums up, if you like, the world that uh, uh, the blindness to the proper understanding of, of modern history and modern development. Um, it is its relentless focus on markets, not simply because it accords to them, as it were, the power to govern, which they clearly, in fact, don't have, don't deserve, and can't properly exercise and generate consequences, which they can't predict, but in a sense also because it misidentifies what the locus of the action actually is anyway. Why markets? Why not, for instance, productive forces? Why not technology? Um, why not, more explosively, corporations? And of course, ultimately, why not governments as the forces that actually govern? And I do find it very telling that the fate, our fate at this particular moment should appear to hang to such a spectacular degree on um, the progress of the vaccine R&D effort. That in itself is in some sense, it seems to me, the most profound refutation of that superficial understanding of how social order is generated um, and what governs you know, what we used to call progress. Um, because what, what our dependence, what our anxious, uh, desperate wait for the vaccine reveals is that ultimately, um, the stuff has to be brought back in, the material reality, the productive forces, our ability actually to control, to a limited extent at least, our natural environment, to actually engage with that. And uh, it's a remarkable fact that it should have been produced by two such striking exponents um, of globalism as the two Turkish scientists who working in Germany with the backing of the German government and with buy-in from a very large vaccine purchased by the United States should have produced this breakthrough. And it is the first, no doubt, of several to come. But that the world economy should pivot at this moment, essentially on a moonshot technological project, 
is in some sense seems to me the most dramatic refutation of that of that disorderly world that world of of organized irresponsibility that Beck pilloried and that and that somebody like Greenspan could celebrate at that moment. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Well, that was utterly fascinating. And I dare say, I'm sure for all of you, a great deal of food for thought. Um, so what we'd like to do is proceed now to what hopefully would meet uh, Adam's description of a healthy reorientation of the conversation. We can, we can be part of that right now. Um, so the way we're going to proceed is that if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a menu there. Um, and one of those is participants. Uh, what you can do is indicate to me, there's an option to raise your hand. You can indicate to me that you would like to ask a question or make a comment. We're gonna take you three at a time. So there'll be a stack that I'll be looking at. Um, just, uh, we'll take you uh, in a cluster of three and then Adam will respond. If you do pursue that particular path, I'd ask you to then turn on your camera, we'll unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself. Um, and then the other option, if you don't want to do that, if you're a little shyer, is to the immediate right of that is the chat function. And you can write out a question and I will read it out to Adam and everyone else. So um, let's see, is there anyone who would like to start us off uh, top of the queue who, who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Don't be shy. All right, Mark Silverman, uh, go ahead and please do. You've activated your camera, great. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, so thank you for the compelling presentation on the economic, social and environmental factors for this crisis situation, which I see as an exclamation point and not a question mark as it was announced. But what about the political response? I'm thinking about the surge in national and exclusionary discourses, the rise of autocratic leaders in the last couple of years, and the concern about a crisis in liberal, so-called liberal values in Western democracies. That seems to me like a fourth area mm -hmm. uh, in this crisis. And how would you try to relate that to the other three? Thank you. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, others with questions or comments? Either through raising your hand or uh, through the participants. Okay, we've got one, I believe, through the chat. Um, all right, this is from James R. How does your analysis relate to economic and social reactions to historical epidemic pandemics such as periodic plagues. Okay. And then finally, or the third one in this cluster from Alberto, are you optimistic about the WEF Great Reset? Is this feasible? All right, those are your first three questions. Oh, those, are, those are all great. Um, I, in a sense, I have to say, I steered a little bit away from politics simply through fatigue. Um, um, but I, 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 I take your point. Um, I think it's actually been very ambiguous um, in its implications. Early on in the crisis, those of us who were concerned to make sense of the um, difference between the dramatic response to Corona, the sudden collective willingness to shut down, and the extraordinary difficulty in gaining momentum in climate arguments, led by Bruno Latour, who wrote a nice piece about this in Le Monde, um, were tempted, I think, to say that the, 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 the specific nature of the threat from Corona, in fact, was, if you like, handing the ball to nationalism, because the classic response to the crisis is one, essentially, of um, lockdown, right? It's of quarantine, it's of putting up boundaries. Um, and that's a, a, that's a historically classic response to an epidemic like this. Um, and so that does play into the hands of, of uh, nationalists. And it's very easy to see that how you can exploit it 
and of course famously in the American case, but also in the Brazilian case, the exploitation of the anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, you know, it was, it was stoked by this. And I think this is true. And obviously you cannot respond in the same way to the climate crisis. Um, a sort of nationalist response there makes relatively little sense unless you're an absolute mega state like China, which may be able to internalize the climate risk. But even for the United States, it's pretty difficult to do that. India and China, I think, may be able to present the climate problem as a national problem and pursue it as such. But increasingly as the crisis has gone on, I think it's become clear that though this is, as it were, structurally biased in favor of a nationalist interpretation, there's no necessity to that. And so I think in the end, historians are going to end up and analysts are going to end up concluding that a crisis is like this is what you make of it. So there are also lots of different ways of not understanding this crisis in those terms of celebrating solidarity, of celebrating community, of celebrating collective effort of decomposing the national into smaller units, which are in fact more relevant in a crisis like that, of then recomposing those smaller units into networks that span across borders. And there are politics which have embraced this, not of course, unfortunately, in the United States, um, but certainly in Europe, there has been a very concerted push towards greater solidarity and the nature of the threat has enabled bargains to be struck there, which one would not have imagined to be possible even six months ago. In fact, as late as April, it wasn't clear the Europeans would be able to do that. So this is a sort of open-ended answer. I agree that there is a structural bias in the particular nature of this threat because it's all about local essentially communication that as it were putting up boundaries in the first instance makes sense. This plays into the hands of nationalist politics, but there's no necessity. And so to that extent, as it were, politicians, interpreters, intellectuals will make of this crisis and indeed everyone else will make of this crisis what they choose and to that extent there isn't there isn't a deterministic logic with regards to what we can learn from history um i tend to be skeptical on that score not because there haven't of course been major epidemics before and the history of modernity is closely associated with pandemic disease and in a sense, it's coterminous with the development of settled civilization, right? The first epidemiological transition is what happens when humans settle down, begin to live in, uh, in, in settled communities, begin to engage in agriculture, live close cheek by jowl with animals. And from that moment on, essentially, we enter a period of increasingly rampant and dangerous epidemic disease, including, of course, the Great Plagues, smallpox, polio, uh, TB, uh, syphilis, um, uh, cholera, which are, have sort of in succession, and then of course the great plagues of the present, and notably HIV, and then as it were the infectious diseases paradigm and the multiply antibiotic resistant strains which we now face as well. So all of those are as it were systematically generated by our collective living. But what strikes me more forcibly is the distinctiveness of our current moment um, in the sense that something triggered in the apparatus of the biomedical, I don't even quite know how to describe it, but let's center it on the hospital. There was something about the particular threat to the viability of the hospital system in this particular crisis that produced a response which is unlike that in the Spanish flu episode of 1918, 1919, which, and I really have spent like Juliana, like years in the archive of that period, that epidemic, though of course we know it was deadly and killed millions, more deadly than our current uh, affliction, barely registers in the political archive of the period. It may at the local level, it does at the city level, we know that very well from certain American cities, but it does not register in the record of the national political arena. Why not? Because there isn't the apparatus to, to convey upwards the signals. We have a problem, we need to do something, we need to act on this. And of course, there was a whole hell of a lot else going on. It's the era of revolutions, the end of World War I. Even as late as the great Asian so-called flus of the 1950s and the 1960s, there isn't that collective response. It seems to me that we cannot understand the extraordinary extent of the response that we have seen this time at all levels unless we understand the specifically historical 
integration, acceptance into the life expectations of people in not just the West, but notably, of course, in China, of the epidemiological transition. In other words, modern Chinese people and across much of East Asia, Europeans and Americans, and indeed Latin Americans too, do not expect to die of a disease like this. And this isn't because this disease is desperately more threatening than many other things that do threaten us. But there is something about the nature of this as an infectious disease that makes it um, uh, uh, dread. It gives it a dread quality and the threat that it poses to the institutional structures on which the orderly hierarchy of death and life, all of the trade-offs which are made in that process is fundamentally disturbed in a way which triggers, uh, which has triggered and which, which produces this really dramatic response. And even people like Trump or Boris Johnson in the UK are highly significant for me, not because they're incompetent, because in the end, you know, this washes out. In fact, the, the differences in mortality are really not that large. But what's really striking about them is precisely because they resist this push to the lockdown, they become significant of the incredible force that that pressure exercises, even on those who are the most reluctant to, to go down this route. There, there are really very few exceptions to the global norm that in the end, in the course of March, you have to bend to the force of the epidemiological predictions, which said millions of people are going to die. And no, it turns out no government in the well, at least the vast majority of governments around the world cannot stand in the face of that pressure. And that is, that's what's different. Um, and it marks a historical shift, which I don't think we understand as deeply, or it takes us by surprise, uh, takes all of us by surprise. And it has, of course, been incredibly difficult to manage in the wake. In other words, we were taken by surprise by our own reaction. The economic fallout was far worse than anyone imagined. And then un unsurprisingly, as it were, counter mobilization set in. And the result is essentially a story of crisis in almost all of the world except East Asia, where neither the epidemic is effectively repressed, nor is the economy uh, uh, maintained on anything more than a kind of, uh, 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 well, it's on a painful level of life support with large sectors of the economy progressively dying as they will continue to do over this winter. The WEF and the Davos people uh, proposing, as it were, this new design strike me as a really interesting example not um, because they, for me, illustrate the um, powerlessness of that kind of way of thinking about how international order is maintained. Um, Schwab and Klaus Schwab would merit really close attention by an intellectual and political historian of them, you know, the caliber of somebody like Quinn Slobodian, who wrote so brilliantly on, on neoliberalism, but didn't actually write about the WEF. But we really need a diagnosis of that type of thinking because it has, I think, absolutely zero chance of actually having any real purchase on the world. But it, it's quite symptomatic and telling, nevertheless, that people who are serious and spend a lot of time around people with real power, nevertheless think in such a schematic and in the end ineffectual way about how order is obtained. I mean, one could really you could make a map of the number of times, I mean, the, the question that's particularly preoccupied me is the one of Bretton Woods, the number of times the idea of a new post-war order, a new Bretton Woods is invoked, a new social contract, um, which I think point to our inability to actually grasp the scale of the complexity, the, the places where power actually lies, the extraordinary difficulty of arriving on uh, collective decisions about, um, the allocation of risk and the allocation of resources to the management of risk, which, which is fundamentally what such an order would entail. Um, but there's almost a sort of nostalgia for a moment of greater simplicity in which those kind of problems could be resolved. And they create a sort of mythical, there's this thing called the post-war moment that we yearn back for, which seems to consist of a sort of weird amalgam of the actual wartime moment, which was Bretton Woods in 1944, the Potsdam Conference, which is one of the most brutal diplomatic meetings ever, you know, conceivable, and a sort of rather candy floss version of meetings between the French and the Germans in 1950, um, suppressing all of the actual violence, complexity and power politics that accompanied what were in the end, of course, very effectual exercises in ordering, but they were effectual because they were backed by, by massive power and indeed by huge amounts of violence.
All right. Well, we've got a couple of Mark. Uh, no, no, we've got three Marth. Great. Excellent. Um, so the first one comes from Phil Gasper. Okay. Um, so I, if you can unmute and then activate your camera as well. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the talk, um, which uh, was brilliant, but also very, very scary <laughs> um, in terms of diagnosing the current situation. Um, uh, you know, this is my whole adult lifetime living through the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the processes that, you have, that you've talked about. Um, I, you know, I was, I, I was one of the people out there in the 1970s organizing around environmental issues and as you say the, you know, the, the, the big issues of um, the, the economy um, driving uh, environmental and epidemiological crises were diagnosed all those years ago and then we switched to you know that was I, I grew up in the era of uh, social democracy in <laughs> in Europe and that switches then to neoliberalism which is a temporary solution to the economic crisis of the of the 70s but then accelerates these uh, mm -hmm. environmental crises so we we come to the current period in which we face both of them now Re renewed devastating economic crises uh, interrelated with these huge environmental crises we're not even out of the current pandemic and while there's a little bit of hope in the in the news about a vaccine we've got another year to go at least of <laughs> suffering mm. through through our current um, uh, situation um, and then uh, the likelihood is another pandemic because mm. the same forces are in play at the moment mm -hmm. um, and then worse than that the climate crisis uh, continues to mm. uh, to accelerate um, uh, you know which is the most devastating threat mm -hmm. um, and all the solutions, I mean, you know, look at the US election, right? On the one hand, we've got the people who deny that anything is happening. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we've got the people who say it's a problem, but whose solutions are so insufficient to the, mm -hmm. to the depth of the, of the crisis. What, you know, what, the, what an incoming Biden administration, if it does income, uh, is proposing is just totally inadequate. And... It probably it can't get most of its its uh, uh, plans through through Congress anyway. So politics, as usual, has no real response to the to the to the, the this this crisis. I mean, in China, as you say, has got enormous resources to to deal mm -hmm. with this, but it's still the the major emitter of of uh, greenhouse gases. It's mm -hmm. it's it's developing sustainable energy resources on the one hand, and the other hand, it is continuing to invest in coal-fired power plants, uh, mm -hmm. both in China and in other parts of Asia. Um, the, the European Union is exporting the crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. So it looks like it's doing well, but it's pushing out the crisis to other parts mm -hmm. of, the, of the world. Uh, and, the, and the US is like lagging, you know, lagging behind. Phil, um, do, you have a, do you have a question that I can... Well, I can the question is, what, you know, what, where do you see the, you know, what, what, what kind of um, solution um do you see to, to problems which are really really urgent and secondly where is it going to come from because none okay. of the political forces yep. um that are currently in play uh seem to either understand the depth of the crisis or be yep. able to you know deal with it excellent okay all right the next one comes from kermit who asks well or maybe it's a statement i don't see a question mark uh while unfettered markets govern blindly and ineptly especially when it comes to controlling unpriced factors such as externalized costs, how might market forces be harnessed by government governmental corrections, e.g. for climate change, a carbon fee and dividend that internalizes costs of fossil fuel damage to the environment? Okay, that was a question. And then the next one is from, and I'm, forgive me if I mispronounce this name, Ji Yu. Is this crisis also an epistemological crisis? What kinds of generative conversations can be had with historians of science and science and technology studies scholars, especially those who focus on environmental science? So there are your three questions. <laughs> they're, they're great questions. I mean, I think the first two, in a sense, uh, are closely related and they quite reasonably ask uh, 
Well, I think my first response is I don't think what I'm the, the description I'm giving, the preliminary sort of effort, was what I'm really trying to do is like pin a tail on the donkey here. And I'm trying to figure out roughly the right area to pin it, pin it into it to see which connections seem to make sense. As a preliminary to being able to sketch the history. What, are, how, what, is, the, what is the box, what is the set of frames within which this has to be located? And what is the chronology with which it needs to be situated in? So it's, it's very confirming for me to hear, Phil, that it makes sense to you. you know, and I do think, I, ha I worry, of course, that I am in a sense engaged in a sort of, sort of stealth version of autobiography, because I think it does, in a sense, map our lives. And that's a worrying tendency in historians as they grow older. So maybe that's what's going on. But I, I tend to think there is some truth to that this being, as it were, a half century history. It may, frankly, just be a warmed over version. What I'm delivering may not be amenable to art giving solutions. It may actually be a rewarmed version of 1970s crisis discourse, which, which is fascinating, has always fascinated me precisely because it is so holistic and it is so comprehensive and it doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to um, to you know, simple solutions. It doesn't necessarily point to obvious points of agency. It could simply be a critical, frankly, rather gloomy, it doesn't necessarily have to be apocalyptic description of reality. Um, I, I say it's not apocalyptic because I do actually see, and this begins to answer both of your questions, forces for change of various types, which aren't motivated by any sort of grand aspiration to emancipation, but I think increasingly enroll very powerful people with very large amounts of resources at their disposal in a project of stabilization. So that I think is, as it were, at this point, a more likely scenario than a complete runaway because, and I'll come back to the final question, but because as I would insist, the basic outlines of this problem have been pretty familiar right from the very beginning. And so, as it were, rather than, rather than, as it were, a complete over the cliff apocalypse, it seems to me that one would, it, precisely because the diagnosis is there and it broadly speaking has purchase on our reality and it is, I don't want to say obvious, but there are various things that clearly need doing and ways to do them. One would therefore expect, and I think we are seeing, um, powerful actors actually begin to respond. So who are those powerful actors? Well, first and foremost, the regime in China. Um, which has an aspiration to very long-term survival. I think one has to take extremely seriously their efforts to shape a 21st century Marxism, which isn't an emancipatory Western Marxism. It is the power project of the CCP, but I think they're deadly serious about it. And that involves essentially internalizing some of the long distant future risks. There's no country in the world other than India, well, there's, China is hugely exposed to climate change and the regime shows every sign of understanding the scale. Now, are they going to be able to implement that? Because as Phil pointed out, they are also the largest constructor of coal fired power stations. Well, China has politics too. China has political economy too. A lot of contending models for trying to understand that. But I don't think there's an unmistakable commitment at this point from the very top down to carbon neutralization, carbon neutrality by 2060. Why? Because they need to. I mean, there is no future for the CCP regime. You know, terroristic concentration camps, lock, stock and barrel, all of it, none of it um, survives in a, any kind of reliable way in a world in which, you know, we have three or four degree warming. Um, the challenges of governance are, are vast. The other area I wouldn't say of hope, but as it were of uh, predictable reaction that I think we can begin to see emerging is in the shape of the mobilization of capital in the West, which um, not in the sense of the factions that back the Trump administration, but uh, in very large and very influential part. And here a forum like the WEF does play a role as a kind of coordinating center of bien pensant big money. Um, is in fact moving towards a program of climate stabilization around something like the Paris targets. Um, and you see this above all in what surely are, I think, the command centers of capital as it exists today, namely in the large asset managers. I mean, if you're in the business of allocating $6 trillion like BlackRock is, you know, you may have some investments in an Exxon, you may have some investments in a BHP, which has coal uh, assets, but the rest of your portfolio needs to be insured against the sort of risks that are coming your way. 
And we saw this even in dealing with the vaccines. There was a, it hasn't been as investigated as much as one would expect. There was a moment, however, in April where a club of large asset managers basically knocked on the door of the pharma industrial complex and said, look, we expect you to share IP, even if we're invested in you, and even if this hurts your profit margin, because we need a vaccine and we need it as quickly as possible. And if that means a sacrifice to your bottom line, that's fine because the rest of our portfolio will benefit so spectacularly from a vaccine. So I think, you know, and this, of course, this idea has a long lineage in Marxist thought, which goes all the way back to the Hilferdings and the Kautskys of the pre-1914 period. It's what they used to call ultra-imperialism, organized capitalism. And this is a fleeting thing. It's not something one can take for granted, but it seems to me that around this emergency, we are beginning to see the emergence of coalitions like that. And when you see the emergence of coalitions like that, then some of the instruments that were put in place in the sort of heyday of neoliberalism and enthusiasm for market management of environmental risks actually begin to have purchase. So if we're seeing it in European carbon markets right now, because carbon markets actually believe that the European Union is getting serious about decarbonisation, the price of carbon certificates is going up. And as the price of carbon certificates goes up, the price of coal powered fire station emissions goes up and they actually begin to shut down. So you have, and then of course, the critical thing is, will the Europeans have the nerve to take those certificates out of circulation to keep the money supply of carbon certificates tight so as to keep the carbon certificates valuable and therefore it continue to exert the pressure. But that is the game that's currently in fact being played out right now. And the carbon price in Europe currently is at a level that actually basically will drive even the most recalcitrant Polish, Polish coal-fired coal power stations out of commission because they're not viable at the current carbon price. So those kind of mechanisms will work if, as it were, you can get credibility and buy-in. So one could imagine the emergence of a kind of green capitalist coalition, which is of course the fantasy of reformist European politics ever since the 1980s. And I think something like that is beginning to emerge. You see the same thing in EV technology with VW and all of the big major manufacturers making huge plays now. They're serious, there won't be internal combustion, new internal combustion engine cars being produced in the rich countries in 20 years time. I think it's pretty clear that that's the, 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 the bell has tolled for them. Are the, are the, is this an epistemic? Uh, crisis. I'm tempted to say not in the sense that, and it goes to the sort of, you know, the, the main thrust of what I've been saying, it seems to me more a question of politics. It's more a question of translating um, the insights that STS, science studies, uh, history of science have provided to us into action. I wouldn't go as far as sort of an impatient climate Anthropocene or capitalocene Leninist like an Andreas Malm who would like to sweep aside the entire legacy of science studies because he basically regards it as threatening to a solid foundational notion of nature on which one can base in his view a proper appreciation of the risks that we're running. Um, that I think is kind of a Luddite response, um, which, is, which is unhelpful in many ways in the same way as I don't fundamentally agree with his politics. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think the problem is, as it were, intellectual innovation at this point. And this isn't to say that I think that, you know, STS is a waste of time or the history of science, that would be absurd. I'm just saying I don't think it's a crisis. I think we understand what this problem is. The question is one of political organization. And that, of course, can't be understood in a formulaic way. Um, it's a question of negotiation. So, you know, Bruno Latour's latest shtick is essentially diplomacy, it's a question of haggling, it's a question of negotiation, in which, as it were, informed by our insights from SDS, the network of participants is drawn very, very widely. So that is the way I feel that it should be engaged. And no doubt, if we are set in motion along a process, down a process of a kind of politicization of science, and of our relate on the relationship between science on the one so society on the one hand and nature on the other if we this will be richly provocative of new insights of various types but i don't i don't it seems to me that we have all the tools to understand this the frustration about our current moment is is not really cognitive it's 
It's a question of action. It's a question of politics, a question of interests and how you articulate them. All right. Well, we have reached a, the, our normal ending point, and I just think I wonder if you have any parting comments that you might want to offer to just sort of wrap things up at this point. Oh my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> or not? <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, and this goes to the sort of epistemology question, like you know, for us as people interested in ideas. Um, you know, I, I would have been tempted to say, you know, it, no, it's, uh, it's uh, Donna Haraway's, you know, uh, motif of sticking with the problem, right? I mean, we, we need courage and endurance to stick with these problems. And, and one can only wish that, we can only wish that to each other as an act of kind of solidarity. Our problem right now is, the problem won't let grip it won't let let hold of us it's not as though we have any option we're, we're forced our noses are rubbed in this problem and that for me has been the real shock of 2020 is that i mean i do have the misfortune of being hit very hard by hurricane dorian last year but but that's a very singular experience a very unusual experience for somebody you know sitting in new york but the the shock of 2020 is that in fact as it were, that injunction to stick with the problem is sort of redundant because, you know, what hell other option do we have? We are all of us continuously negotiating. And I think our, our solutions, our emotional, you know, the politics of Corona go, as we most of us know, all the way down into the household inside our own heads. We convene little parliaments of our own inner demons every day, struggling to try and resolve how we get through this. And um, that is perhaps a way uh, in which this is really a, to put it in a banal way, a kind of learning moment. Um, because this is, this is the Anthropocene in a very dramatic way. This is not, it doesn't have the externality even of a, of a hurricane which destroys your house and blows your cars into the trees. But um, you know, it gets inside our heads in a way that um, I've never experienced anything like it. And, um, and uh, the, the, the action therefore of thinking in this crisis and through this crisis has an existential quality that I've not experienced before. And I think that's where, that's where maybe this does feel a little bit like an epistemological crisis <laughs> in the sense that hell, I didn't expect to have to actually think about my own life and on my immediate collectivity and the way this has forced us to do. So maybe maybe I'll take that back and qualify my answer there uh, in on reflection. Okay, Thank you for well, the discussion. It's been very interesting. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, as um, now I've come to say a number of times, um, there's no way to do what we normally would do of, of a round of applause, but it, people can do at the very bottom, again, of the, your menu, there are reactions there. You can offer, for example, um, clapping hands or an upturned thumb. Um, I certainly feel that way, two th 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 thumbs up. Um, thanks again, Adam. Uh, I just wanna, while you're still with us, to mention again that we have a couple of more talks, actually three more talks coming up, two next week. One will be by um, 